You don't think it's powerful? Try shouting it at Walmart one day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One day when I feel like going to jail, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. You'll, you'll stir up every demon in hell. Hallelujah. Devils don't like that name. Right. You, you can say any other kind of name, they won't fool with you. Say the name of Jesus. And they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna have some movement. You know what I'm telling you? Hallelujah. Just like Jesus, every time he went in the synagogue, if there was a demon there, it rose up. They, they come up and start shouting and screaming and everything else. The same way with the presence. See the presence here right now. Demons can't be in here. They can't be in here. Now when you walk outside, you might meet somebody in here. They ain't going to be in here. The name is too powerful. Hallelujah. Demons tremble at that name, the Bible says. Hallelujah. I'm glad I came here. I'm glad I woke up. There's no better place to be, no safest place to be. No place to be that you're going to get something you didn't deserve. The grace of God's here. He's going to minister to us. You don't deserve that. We don't deserve eternal life. We don't deserve healing. We don't deserve deliverance. We don't deserve hope, peace, joy. We don't deserve any of that. But we get it. Hallelujah. God's good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, today, I'm going to conclude our series on what we know. This is the fifth one message. And um, by looking at with the Apostle John's closing remarks in the last part of this, this uh, book. You know the concluding remarks in all the New Testament? If you want to do a little study, read all the New Testament letters that were written and just read what, how they ended it. How they ended every one of them. Because usually they try to consolidate and conclude everything that they put in the letter to try to make sure you get it. And this is what John does in the last part of this particular book, 1 John. And uh, John kind of summarizes uh, the main body of the letter. And uh, as I stated in the beginning of this series, the thing that caught my attention when I studied this book is how many times John uses the word no. He's saying we know, we know, we know. And, and uh, we look at that. And, and that's what caught my attention. I said, why do you keep saying we know, we know? He's trying to tell us what really matters. The things, the truth of God that really matters, he keeps reminding us what we know. And he uses the word know over 35 times in a short letter. But I'm going to read the last nine verses of this book. The last nine verses of the book, he mentions the word know seven times. He comes back at us with it again. Seven times in nine verses he uses the word no. So I think it's important for us to read it. We're going to read it. Verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You got that? This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us. See? We know. We're not just shooting words up in the air. We know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. Verse 16. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray. And God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. But there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin. And there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. We know that, right? We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. 
The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we're children of God, don't we? Come on. Yeah. You gotta know this. Come on. <laughs> and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. I know that too. We know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding. See, I never thought I, I, I thought I was smart before, but I wasn't really smart until I really knew what God says and how I can look at the world and see, I got understanding now. I was a fool before, but I got understanding now so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, even His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So I titled the message, This is the Confidence. John provided several specific ways in which the believer can act on what he... In other words, everything he wrote in those five chapters there, he's going to conclude that we know these things and the specific things. And I believe... I see John's heart at the end of the letter. He's trying to tell you what really matters here. He's trying to pour out his heart to the church. And I want to take, uh, and I believe these last nine verses of Scripture, these things that John keeps re, re edifying that, that we need to know these things because I believe it's really, we know these things as the lifeline to being a Christian. You're going to live the Christian life. You better have these things down. You better have certain truths solidified. I got them. That's what keeps me. That's what's going to keep you. You got to have certain truths in your heart and your life that you know are real. See, and this is why we have confidence because we know some things. See, I know things and I know they're true. That's what keeps me. All right, we're going to take a look at these things. The first thing is in verse 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. So who is John writing to? He's writing to the church. He's not writing to the world out there. He's writing to people who have believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just sang about it. How beautiful it is. How powerful it is. How wonderful it is. It's so great, that name. He's talking to people who believe in the power in the name of Jesus Christ. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to us. He said he wasn't writing to unbelievers. He's writing to people who know the power of the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the only name. The only name given under heaven by which we must be saved. You can't be saved under any other name. I grew up in a religion that had all kinds of names. You pray to this name, that name, over here, that name, do this, bow to this one, kiss this one, all this kind of stuff. There's only one name. Only one person who died on the cross of Calvary. His name is Jesus. There's no other name. And John wrote that, that, that there's no other name under heaven. John wrote this to make sure that we have eternal life. Now, John is stressing the importance of having eternal life. You know you have eternal life? I know I got it. I know I had it for 45 years. I have eternal life. You might kill this body. You ain't killing me. You kill this body, but you're not... Killing me. That's what Jesus said. What's the most people can do? You kill you? After that, it can't do you no more. But you still will live. Jesus said, everybody who believes in me, even though he dies, he lives. And those who live with me and believe in me will never die. I'm not going to die. So at my funeral, don't cry. You can shed a tear. Say, I missed him. <laughs> but the last thing I want you to do is feel sorry for me. <laughs> Don't feel sorry for me. Rejoice, because I'm looking at Jesus. You ever done that? I want to see that face. I want to see the one who died for me. See, there are people who are professing 
to believe in Jesus. All these people got religion, they profess, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. The devils believe in Jesus. Devils know that Jesus exists. Devil knows who Jesus is. That's why they shouted at him when he came to the earth. But their lifestyle, these people who profess to be Christians, their lifestyle doesn't match up. Because if you really knew Jesus, your life would be different from people in the world. See, your life would bear witness that, that you have eternal life. See, having eternal life is being experiencing being born again. And, and I believe if you really are born again by repenting of your sins and accepting Jesus by faith, it, you would know you have eternal life. That something, listen, I, I say this all the time, 45 years ago when I knelt down except Christ, I knew that what happened to me was nothing I did. I, somehow, I touched the supernatural. And let me tell you something. If you touch the supernatural, it's over. It should be over. Now, some people come forward and have an emotional experience. Oh, I'm, I'm just sorry for my sin. No, man. you got to be born again. Yeah. See, the, the supernatural has to touch you. Listen, I pray for many people. They come down, they, they cry, snot and everything. And then the next week, they live in just like they were living before. What happened? Well, they had an emotional thing. This ain't no emotional thing. I'm talking about being born again. I'm talking about having supernatural power into your life that changes you forever. Okay? This has always been my concern as a pastor. And I've been pastoring for 36 years now. Is that, that every person that God gives me to care for will show evidence show evidence that they've been born again. See, I don't want to just draw a crowd. We don't want just people filling up in here. I want people in here that have been touched by God, have, have received Christ, and their life is changed. That's it. See, as a pastor, that's what my focus is on. Not that you just show up here every Sunday. You can show up here every Sunday and split hell wide open. That's right. You need to show up here because you've been born again. That, that, that you love God. Amen. That God is number one. Yes. You're going to honor the Lord's day. You're going to come and worship the God that saved you. Yes. And that you're truly born again and have eternal life. See, when we know we got eternal life, then the attitude towards this world is different. I don't know about you, the things I used to love. Bourbon Street, French Quarter, all of that stuff, warehouse, all the concerts, and all the rock and roll, and all the smoking dope, and all that. I thought that was it. But you see, when eternal life comes in, you have a different attitude. See, man, that stinks. I used to love the smell of French Quarter. Now, it makes you want to throw up when I go down there. And I don't go down there unless I absolutely have to. See, when you know that, that supernatural experience of being born again, that, that you know that this is nothing you have done, think about this. You, you don't get born again because of what you did. You become born again for what God did on the cross of Calvary and that something happened to you. God touched your life. God loved you so much to touch your life. So what are you going to do after that? God showed his love to you, forgave you of all your sins, washed you clean. So what are you going to do with that? You're going to just forget about it? You can't forget about it. Because you changed. And that change is a God thing. I knew I, I changed it. Listen, the night I got saved, it was on Veterans Highway at, at Lakeview Christian Center. It was at nighttime. But when I got out and went down Veterans Highway, the same highway I used to hang at all them bars and all them things there, I looked at it. God, it's like God shining a light on it. Yeah. And I could see it for what it was. 
I said, I can't believe I was in those places. I can't believe I was doing what I was doing. You see, my attitude towards the world changed, and that's supernatural. Listen, religion don't do that to you. Being touched by God supernaturally does that. See, and by continuing to believe in the name of Jesus, see that Christ will dwell in your heart. See, somebody's living in me now. Christ in me should be in every born again believer. If Christ is in you, where are you going to take Christ? Where are you going to take him? Think about it. What are you going to sit down and watch with Christ living in you? What are you going to pick up and smoke if Christ is living in you? What are you going to drink if Christ is living in you? What words are going to come out of your mouth if Christ is living in you? How are you going to dress if Christ is living in you? Faith lives only by love, which we covered last week. Remember, if you don't love God, you think you're going to live like the world. If you really love God, something's going to really happen to you. Love continues only by obedience. We know we love. Jesus said, I know you'll love me if you obey my commandments. If you don't obey what I tell you, you don't love me. You love the world. You love yourself. See? He who believes has the witness of eternal life. I know I have eternal life. He who has this witness in you, Christ is living in you. That's the witness. The spirit of the living God is in you. Paul said, Christ in us is the hope of glory. See, I know I got eternal life. If I die tonight, I got eternal life. I don't fear death. I fear getting hurt. I don't want to get hurt. But, but as far as death is concerned, bring it on. You do me a favor. I'm going on the other side. I'm out of here. <laughs> he who believes loves. He who believes obeys. This person really is a person of prayer. This is what John is telling us here. If you really believe that, this is what he says in verse 14. This is the confidence we have. In approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will. Now this is very important here. You say well he didn't, he didn't answer my prayer. Well why don't you find out if that's what really. What God really wants for you. Why don't you find that out first. If that's what God really wants for you. Then you pray about it. See. It's a, according to his will he hears us. And if we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask. We know that we have what we ask of him. Now, what, what is God's will? You say, well, what is God's will? Why don't you read this? You'll find out. Right. See, God wants your whole family saved. We, we are seeing such marvelous things in our family right now. We got grandkids that were out there. They're coming in. With a vengeance. They're mad at the devil. They want to. They want to just go after the devil and his works. They want to save people. We got a granddaughter. We got to hold her back. She's 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 running. She can't do enough, fast enough. It's amazing. See, that's the difference. When you're born again and God touches your life, you're going to be changed. But where does this confidence come from? John says that, you know, if we know that he hears us, this is our confidence when we're approaching God. We know that he hears us. Think about that. If you really believe God hears you, you'd be praying. Right. <laughs> if you really believe that. If you really believe God hears you, you'd be praying. Why wouldn't you? The problem is, I don't know whether I believe that or not. I believe it. Start praying. According to his will. He hears you. And you can trust him. See. Think about it. You got. 
when you got saved, when we became born again, we touched God. And God touched us. Somehow, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and repenting of our sins and believing in Christ, we went through the veil into the presence of God. Think about that. You were in the presence of God when you got saved. You were in His presence. You were at the altar of God in His presence. We went through that. So if we went through there once, I can go through there again in my time of need. That's what the book of Hebrews says. It's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with what? With confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. You got to have confidence. I got confidence. This is what John is trying to tell you. We know. What's going to give you confidence? What's going to give me confidence is I know for sure. See, I know for a fact. I'm saved. I know for a fact if I believe in the name of Jesus and I pray that he hears me and he's going to deal with me. I got confidence in that. The King James Version says this in, in that verse. He says, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Come boldly. Don't come scared. Why am I going to come scared? I'm coming to my father. Yeah, hey. come on. Come on. <laughs> I'm a child of God. I know I'm a child of God. That's what, that's what John said. We know we're children of God. That means I have a father. I don't be afraid to come to my father. He loves me. He gave me life. He birthed me. He cares for me. He loves me. So I'm going to come boldly before the throne of God. I'm not an outsider. I'm an insider. Because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, I have a right. To have a right. I'm a child. I have a child. I'm a child. I can come in before God. I can ask my Father for grace and mercy in time of need. We don't deserve it. He's our Father. He's going to give it to us. How many of us have, we gave stuff to our kids? Eh? that they deserve it. We just love them. We're going to give it to them. See, we're not strangers anymore. We used to be. But we're children of God. Now, 1 Peter 2.10, I love this verse of Scripture. Just love it. You want to get confidence? Look what it says. It says, once you were not a people. See, when I was out there in the world cursing God, doing everything, I wasn't even know. I was a nobody. You are nobody. You're out there on your own, doing your own thing, living your own life, could care less about God or anybody else. You weren't nobody. But look what he said. But now, you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. You know what mercy is? When you was away from God, you deserved hell. You deserved hell. But God's mercy showed up. Mercy, the difference between grace and mercy, grace is getting something we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. You know, when you go to court, you want the mercy to court. You know you're guilty, but you want mercy. Can you let me off this time? Well, God's going to show you mercy. You deserve hell. But His mercy and His love is going to be shed abroad on you. Where you're, not, you're not going to hell. I was headed to hell. This world is headed to hell. So we have confidence in praying to a God who loves us. you got to understand that. You're saved because He loves you, not because of anything you did. He loves you. Now, we've got three verses of Scripture here that is our grounds for confidence in God. The first ground for confidence is in verse 18. He says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, 
and the evil one cannot harm him. I mean, he's been harmed by the devil. I mean, harmed by the devil. He had beat me down, <coughs> turned me around, upside down, inside and out. He turned me. He wanted to kill me. He wanted to kill you. He wants you to take enough drugs. Listen, my, my granddaughter just told my, my, uh, her mother that another one of the, 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 the people that she was hanging with, another one, this is the second one, that died in an overdose of heroin. Second one. You know what she told her mama? I got to get to him. I got to tell him. What's the difference? She was hanging with them people. Now she wants to go back and tell them. See, John is stating here that the new nature we have received from God doesn't want to sin. You know how we wanted to sin? I wanted to sin. I wanted to do everything. I want to explore everything. Smoke this. Start this. Drink this, do this. I had a dealer every time we wanted to bring me something new. How about I'm trying this? Put this in a pipe and smoke it. Yeah. We did it. <laughs> like to paralyze me? Sister Dawn lost her hearing for about an hour. Yeah, that's good. Isn't it? <laughs> Try something new. But guess what? When that new nature comes into you, you don't want that stuff. You hate that stuff. You want to just get away from trying to tell people, don't do that. There's a new nature. There's, there's a life that's taking a different course. I'm going to heaven. I got heaven on my mind. It's been on my mind. John states, as long as this new nature rules, Look what he says here. If this new nature rules, Satan can't touch me. Right. He can't touch me. He, he led me around like a dog on a chain. Right. He'll lead you. He'll lead you into the slop of this world. And you think you're free. He's got that noose around your neck, pulling you every way he wants you to go. Now John told us this back in chapter 4. In, in verse 4, he says, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. See, I realize that now. I realize that now. I don't have to do that. I'm greater than him. He that's within me is greater than he that's within the world. That's the devil. And don't forget, years ago, when I was in the hairdressing business, I was, I was up in New York with Paul Mitchell before Paul Mitchell really got famous. I was at his salon. Spent a week with him at his salon. Well, every day after the classes were over with, they break the weed out. I have to say, I'm out of here. You can do what you want. I didn't come here for that. I'm out of here. Come on. That's what the world does. Right. See, that, 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 that's what the world does. But you see, I've got power. Now, before, I'd have jumped in. Roll me up something. I don't want that. Because you see, that new nature doesn't go that route. Come on. I'll see you in the morning. I'll do what you want. I'll see you in the morning. I ain't going that route. There's someone living in me that is greater than that. See, the devil had them. I'm free of that. You see, the supernatural power in us overcomes the world. I don't have to worry about whether uh, 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 I'm going to be caught up in sin. I don't have to be caught up in sin. I tell Christians all the time, you have no excuse to sin. You have no excuse. If he that's within me is greater than he is in the world, I don't have to sin. 
You can sin if you want to. You don't have to. Right. Remember years ago, when all the ministers in Louisiana was falling into immorality, especially in my denomination that I was in, and, and people used to say, well, Pastor, you know, that could happen to you. I said, you know, you're right. It could happen to me, but it don't have to. It didn't have to happen to them. It didn't have to happen to them. If they're preaching what they're preaching, and the Christ that is in us is real, you don't have to do that. You can do it, but you don't have to. <laughs> So the second ground of confidence is this. In verse 19, we know that we're children of God. And the whole world is under the control of the evil one. This is, let me tell you this. See, this reaffirms to us in our minds who we are. God, uh, John wants the fact that God is our Father and our God. We're children of God. Yes, we got earthly parents, but you see, God is really my Father. God is my Father. See, this life I have now was birthed through Him. He gave me this life, this eternal life. See, John, John wants us comforted with the certainty that God is our Father and He will protect us. Now, then the second half of this verse, John states that the whole world is under the power of Satan, the devil. See, the devil can't harm the Christian, but the world without Christ is helplessly under his control. Let me tell you something. There's only two people in the world. There's born again believers. And then there's the other people. All the other people. Are under the control. Of the devil. You say no. They don't. They don't. Uh, you know the agnostic. They don't want to take a position. Well I don't know whether I want to believe in God. Or not believe in God. I'm going to just stay in the middle. There ain't no middle. You either are or you aren't. You're either born again or you're not. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no other place. Now some of us are brought up in a religion and said there's a, a place where you can work it out. You can't work nothing out. If you could work it out, he wouldn't have had to die on the cross of Calvary. Amen. It's heaven or hell. You decide here. Here is when you decide where you're going. Heaven or hell. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. That's what Jesus said. There's only two people here. Children of Satan, children of God. Who are you? You have to decide. But the thing is, it, John said the devil can't harm the Christian. I, he can't harm me. He can't harm me. Let's have face the devil, face demons, and, and what have you. I tell people about we cast demons out. They say, oh, I'm afraid of that. Afraid of what? <laughs> afraid of what? Demon? I mention the name of Jesus, he's going to tremble. Amen. That's right. That's right. We got a dad. What I got to be afraid of demons? Oh, they, they're demons, demons. Demons what? I don't go look for them. I step on them. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We don't have to go looking for demons. No. Jesus said we'll trample on them. That's right. we'll step on them. Yeah. Kick them. Move them out the way. They'll, they'll get out of our way. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If you got the Holy Ghost and your demons going to flee from you. Yeah. They, they, they know who they can fool with and who they can't. That's right. Come on. So this was the devil can't harm you, but you know something? When you look at the world out there, you look at people that's not saved. How the devil has them. They're enslaved. They're enslaved. They don't have no hope. They don't have no joy. They don't have no peace. They're addicted. He wants you addicted. He wants you a slave. See? That's what he wants you. And when you look at people like that, listen, that, I tell you, every time I, I don't go to convenience stores that often, but you see these people, they drive up there, they got cars that are barely running, barely running, smoking, everything. They go in and buy four packs of cigarettes, six pack of, of beer, and, and five lottery tickets. I said, man, what is their hope? What is their hope? I, I feel so sorry for them. I said, they, they lost without hope in a the world. 
All they have to do is call on the name of Jesus. The whole world will change. I guarantee you that. I've seen it too many times. The answer to the world is Jesus. And they're under the devil's control. If you've got family members that's not serving God, they're under the devil's control. You don't believe that? Listen to this. Acts chapter 26. The apostle Paul was going to, to go to Damascus to uh, arrest Christians. And put him in jail. The Apostle Paul, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And look what Jesus tells him. In verse, verse 17, chapter 26. He said, I will rescue you from your own people. Because when, you see, he was a Jew. When he starts preaching Jesus, his own people are going to turn against him. He says, I'm going to rescue you from your own people. And from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them. The Gentiles is us. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What he was going to do? He was going to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. See, Satan has Every person out there that is not saved, Satan has them. That's what the Bible says. That's what God said. That's what the Lord said to the Apostle Paul. Satan has those people. You say, oh, they're nice people. They might be nice on the outside, but Satan's got them. Everybody's not murderers. Everybody's not rapists. Everybody's not, 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 not sinners. They sin as if they don't except Christ. That's the only sin that's going to send you to hell. There's only one sin that's going to send you to hell. Reject that. You reject that, you bought your ticket to hell. That's your ticket to heaven. Let me tell you something. All the governments of the world, I've been around the world a little bit. In fact, I've been on the other side of the world. I was so far away from here that I was on the other side of the world that no matter whether I went east or west, it was the same amount of distance to get home. That's how far away I was. It was in Siberia. The devil controls all those governments. All of them. Russia, Ukraine, Canada, Mexico, South America, Central America, Africa, he's got them all. Even our own. He's got this government also. You don't think that? that they're, taking, they're trying to take the rights of Christians away. The spirit of Antichrist is in this, in our government too. You don't believe that? Why are they allowing women to shed innocent blood in abortion clinics, it's legal. Go kill your baby. Go kill him. Innocent blood. Who's doing that? The devil's doing that. The devil is a murderer. He's a thief. He's a robber. He's a murderer. To shed innocent blood. For women to give them a right to kill their unborn children. To give homosexuals right to to live and, and try to get all the rights of normal people, want the government to condone their perverted lifestyle. Yeah. You know I can go to jail for this. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care. Come on. All that perversion, all that, all that people don't know what they are anymore. They don't know whether they're a man or woman. They don't know anything. The devil's confusing their mind. Give them a reprobate mind. Listen, you reject God, you don't have a mind. That's right. right. The devil's got your mind. That's right. You don't have a mind till you have the mind of Christ. Yes, Lord. Come on. It's taking, giving homosexuals rights, giving, taking prayer out of our schools. You can't mention God nowhere. Don't tell me our government is godly. It's not God. It's anti-God. Right. Anti-Christ. 
That's why John states you're either one of God's children or you're under the control of the devil. You don't have a neutral place. you got to make up your mind. Now, who you are. Now, the third ground of confidence is this. In verse 20, John says, we know also. See, all the things we know, if you knew all this, man, we, we're doing good. We know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding. It's amazing how when you get saved, how much wisdom comes in you. Yes. How much understanding comes into your mind. It, it just He gives us that understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, even His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. That's who He is. We know that. Again, John remind the believers of what we know to be true. This is what gives us confidence. We know what is true. They know that the Son of God has come. See, the false teachers have, have done their best to set Christ on the side. Like there are other teachings that are more important than the knowledge of God. No, there's no teaching more important than knowing who God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. But John is explaining throughout his letter that it's really impossible. And this is what people don't understand. They say, well, I, I believe in God. No, you, you might believe there's a God. Yeah, you, you'd be a fool not to believe just looking at creation. But to really know God, you're going to have to know Christ. You will not know God without knowing Christ. This is how we know who God is. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you see me, you see the Father. You hear me, you hear the Father. I and my Father are one. So you don't know who God is. You say, well, how? nobody can know God. You'd have to be God to really understand God. But to know God, the only way you're going to know God is through Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other way. No other religion. The Buddhists, the Hindus, the Mormons, the, the Jehovah's Witness, whoever they are. There's many Christ being preached out there. But let me tell you, you know how you're going to know the real Christ? The one who changes your life. Yes. Oh, yeah. Not religion. Because you change religion. You can change religion all day long. But when you meet the real, true Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you, your life has changed and become born again. That's when you know you got the right one. Because the other ones won't do that. That's why Jesus came to reveal the Father. Jesus Christ is the subject. When you get the Holy Spirit, you read this book, Jesus is in Genesis all the way through to Revelation. He is the subject of every book in here. Old Testament and New Testament. This book is about the Son of God. This book is a bloody book. There's blood from Genesis. There's blood all the way to Revelation. It's a bloody book. You know why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I thank God that we have a bloody religion. We believe that the blood of Jesus Christ washes us clean. Jesus is central to everything we believe. And it's Jesus, period. Not Jesus plus. People say, well, you can have Jesus, but you're also going to have our religion. I don't have to have anything. All i got to do is have him. <laughs> He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. I got him, I got everything. Jesus came to earth, returned to heaven. Now, guess what? He's here right now by His Spirit. His Spirit is here revealing to us who the Father really is to enable a believer to have Him experientially. I experience God. See, I know. I've experienced Him. And they say a person with an experience is not 
at the mercy of a person with an argument. You can argue all you want. Right. Right. I've experienced God. Come on. I'm born again. You can argue all you want. Say I'm not this, that, and the other. I know what I am. I've experienced God. And the Holy Spirit has given me understanding that I can know that God is true. This is where our confidence comes from. I know what I am. I know what God says. I believe it. It's part of my life. And as the Holy Spirit teaches believers about Christ and points up, you know what the Holy Spirit does? Convicts you of sins, brings you to the cross. Yeah. Convicts you of your sin, brings you to the cross. Showing you a sinner and showing you the answer. Here's the answer. And then what does Christ do? Christ then reveals who God is. By the Holy Spirit, we come to Christ. Christ reveals who the Father is. So the Son teaches believers about God and points them to the Father, to be in God, to be in His Son, Jesus Christ. When believers are united to the Son, they're united to the Father. When I unite myself to Christ, I'm in God. And God is in me. George said he is the only true God. He's referring to Christ. You need to bring Jehovah's Witness to that verse of Scripture. The Father is the source of eternal life, and it's Jesus Christ that reveals that life to us when we come to Him. So Christ is eternal life. Only through His death and resurrection. We sang about that. I love that. Death could not hold Him down. And guess what? Death is not going to hold us down. Because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, Paul said, is in me. Yeah. He's in you. Right. Death ain't going to hold us down. I'm going to shoot right out of death. I'm going to look at death, stick my tongue out in death. <laughs> but look, John, we're going to close this, the last verse. Last verse of this, of this whole book. Verse 21, he says this. And when he's saying this, he's not saying it harshly. He's saying it with as much love as he possibly can. In verse 21, he said, Dear children, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. That's amazing, isn't it? All the stuff he's saying, all the stuff he's teaching us, the last word he says is, Keep yourselves from idols. That's a loving statement. Because you see, John knew, see in John's time, there were idol temples on every corner. There's idols everywhere we looked in this world. There's so many things that can take your heart and turn it from God. There's so many things you can give yourself to that turns it from God. He's telling us, stay away from idols. How do you know it's an idol? Well, an idol is anything that takes your heart that you love more than you love the things of God. Just like showing up here today. Well, you know, it's all right, I need to go do this, so I need to go do that. I need, if you really love God, see, anything you put before God is an idol. And that could be your wife, your husband, your children, your job. It could be anything in this world. You put it ahead of God, it's an idol. So well, I don't bow down to it. No, you ain't going to bow down to it. It's just keeping you from God. Something your heart loves more than the things of God. Now, anything that consumes your energy and efforts more than God. See, a person can make an idol out of anything. A person can take anything and worship it before God. And he can allow it to consume his mind and his heart. What will keep us from doing that? What will keep you from having an idol in your life? What will keep you from doing that? Well, I'm going to tell you. John said in this whole thing, it's what we know. It's what we know that is true. 
See, if we know these things are true, it's going to keep us from idols. You don't believe it will keep us from idol and, for, and, and false teaching. Now, the first verse in our text, John said this in, ver in verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. Listen to me. I'm going to be 73 years old a couple of weeks. I know I don't look it. Don't feel it. Of course, I don't know what 73 feels like. I've never been there before. But, but sooner or later, this life here on earth is going to end. It's going to end. But the greatest thing we can have in our possession is eternal life. And let me tell you something. You don't have to be old to die. Think about that. Sometimes young people, they have in their mind, I'm not going to die until I get old. No, you can die today. People are dying all ages. From just being two hours old, being born, babies are dying, people, teenagers are dying, everybody's dying. Everybody's dying. But the greatest thing you need to have in your possession is eternal life. And as a pastor, the greatest thing, the greatest burden that, that, that is on me and the pastors of a church is to make sure that everybody that's under our care has it. Come on. I don't want to just see your face here. I want to know you have eternal life. I want to know that if I had to do your funeral today, that I can say, they're looking at Jesus. See, they're looking at Jesus. I can say they worship God. They, they, they love God. They, they, they did that. Let me tell you something. I've done funerals where I couldn't say that. I didn't know. But as your pastor, I want to know. Yeah. You have eternal life. Yeah. I want to know you know you have it. Yeah. Yeah. And the way I know you have it is your life. Mm -hmm. The type of life you are living will tell me you have it. Because if you have it, there's a certain lifestyle you're going to take. Right. It ain't going to be worldly. No. It's going to be godly. Right. And like I say, we want to see this place filled with people. Listen, we had a church in Shaw met 600 people packed it out. But you know what? I want to know if every one of those people have eternal life. I don't want to just see people. I want to know that everybody listening to me has eternal life. That is my goal as a pastor. Do you have eternal life? It should be the burden of every Christian. That your family members have it. it. It should be a burden to you. Not just as a pastor. I carry that burden. But you ought to have the burden for your own family. You got people in your family. Husband, wife. That's not saved. You need to be burdened for them. You need to be praying for them. You need to be believing God for their life. Because if they die. This is the only shock they got. We need to be certain it's in our possession. And I want to tell you something. This is the pastor's here desire. Our desire is to see eternal life working out in your life. It's working out in your life. The things of God are manifesting themselves in your life. That's what we see. That's us pastors. That's what we do. We are shepherds of God's people. You know what shepherds do? They examine the sheep. I'm looking. I'm listening. I want to know. You have eternal life. Stand with me. You might be here today. There's not many of us here, but I really don't care. If you're here right now, you say, Pastor, I am not certain 
And what, what the Apostle John kept saying over and over and over again, we need to know. We've got to know. If I was just having a religion and not really sure where I'm going to go, what, you know, when the end of life comes, where I'm going to be, I know for sure where I'm going to be. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. That's what the Apostle Paul told the church. He says, as long as I'm living, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to minister to you. He said, but if I die, it's going to be better for me. It's better for you that I'll stay alive so I can minister to you. But if I die, it's better for me. I'm going to be better off where I'm going. Paul knew exactly where he was going. We need to know exactly where we're going. You're here right now. As we begin singing this song, he said, Pastor, I need to leave here absolutely certain that I have eternal life. Watch your step out from where you are. If you're here right now, say, Pastor, I want to know for sure when I leave here that I have eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're certain you have eternal life, let's gather around this altar. Let's worship the God who saves you. <coughs>